the um, presentation and Jeffrey will be, don't worry about scribbling them down from my slides because Jeffrey will be loading those URLs in the chat and you can get them from there at your leisure. So let's get started. Um, okay, the first, the first slide is about our budget. And folks, we don't have a budget. Uh, as you, if you've been reading the newspaper, you know that the House, the Senate, and the Governor have all been disagreeing about um, how our budget should look. What I can tell you is what I'm hearing is going to look likely, which is that uh, it looks that the House plan is going to be the likely scenario going forward. Um, that plan does include a cut to state aid of 2%. And that equals to about $284,000. How that cut is going to be realized is still unclear at this time. There have been two different scenarios put on the table. One is um, the Senate suggested cutting uh, targeted libraries, basically libraries that were at the top end of the state aid scale, and that was for the county libraries, it was Wake and Mecklenburg counties. Um, I've heard the budget director say that they've got enough money to operate and they don't need it as much as the smaller libraries in the state. Uh, so at this point, we don't know if the cut will be a targeted cut to certain libraries or if it will be a cross the board cut or even it could be a hybrid of those two. So. We're obviously watching the situation closely. Also unclear is whether these cuts would be recurring or non-recurring. But um, we've got um, staff here at the Department of Cultural Resources whose job is to keep a track of all of this. And so I checked with her right before um, the session, and nothing has changed yet. But as soon as it does, um, information will go out on the list, sir. So if there are any questions about state aid, ask them now, because I'm getting ready to move on to our next source of funding, and that is the Library Services and Technology Act, as awarded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Our allotment is uh, about $4.1 million, and that is strictly a per capita basis. You know, the bigger states with more population get higher awards than the smaller states. Um, the big news here is that we have announced the competitive grant awards for 1415. So these are the awards that are being made to libraries that submitted uh, grant applications. Um, we have made 56 awards, and that's over $2 million going out for grants in you know, lifelong literacy, lifelong learning, digitization, planning, outreach, and my favorite new category, innovation grants. And then we also keep um, about $1.9 in-house for statewide projects. And this is the Digital Heritage Center that we fund over at UNC, um, NCpedia, our North Carolina Encyclopedia, uh, the NC Cardinal Project. So you can see the URL there for the complete list of grant awards. And before I move on to that, I do want to mention that next year, IMLS legislation is up for reauthorization. This is going to be a big advocacy effort for libraries all over the country, because just as we're having questions in our own legislature about the efficacy of libraries, and what do libraries really do, and do we need libraries? Why don't we just give everybody a $10 Google card and let them use that? Uh, the same questions are being asked on the federal level. And so IMLS is working with states to try to get data from us from our grants that we give and from the statewide projects that we fund that can help them prove the value of public libraries in Congress. So this is going to be more important than ever next year because of the reauthorization. Uh, because, you know, that it could change. Um, so why am I giving you the list of grant awards? Because it's not too early to start thinking about next year. What do you want to do? What would you do if you could get an LSTA grant in one of these categories? And you can see them right there for digitization or innovation, 
literacy and lifelong learning or planning and so forth. So one thing that we do that will make it very easy for you to not only get ideas but to see what other libraries are doing is to go to this URL and read the abstracts of the grant projects that were funded in 14-15. So the very first one that comes up in the long list of 56 projects <clears throat> is the digitization project from Forsyth County. Every funded grant has an abstract on this site so you can get in and see what other libraries are doing <coughs> and what projects were deemed to be fund worthy by the LSTA Advisory Committee. So I have to say I just served on a, a national grant review panel for IMLS and there were a lot of really bad grants around. So um, we are here to help you um, come up with ideas, help you craft projects that will meet the needs that you see in your own community and stand ready to help you at any time. Ray Oldham is the consultant for LSTA and will do a wonderful job helping you even get your thinking together about a potential grant, much less uh, she will even read draft grant proposals. So we'll do everything. We're bending over backwards to try to help you all. So please start thinking about it. It may seem like it's a long way away, but it'll be here before you know it. <coughs> Turning now to the government and heritage library portion of the state library. This is the library part of the library and we actually have stacks and we actually have users and part of that library is the genealogy department and I just think this is cool and wanted to let you all know we're working with Wake Forest University on a MOOC, a multi-something online course and this is going to be about beginning genealogy and our staff are providing the expertise for this MOOC and I'm hearing that MOOCs to be successful, they really need about a thousand people to sign up. So we were letting people know early that this is going to be open. The registration will be opening up this fall. And maybe some of your local genealogy patrons would be interested, much less staff. <coughs> Another thing that the GHL does, and this is gaining in popularity every year, is that they sponsor the Family History Fair. Um, here in Raleigh on a Saturday in October. People from all over the state come to this. We have exhibitors with their wares that all have to do with genealogy. You have presentations and exhibits by professional genealogists and just some neat stuff. Last year we had somebody that could decipher um, <clears throat> the Germanic lettering, the very old timey lettering. We have um, professional genealogists. If, you're, if you've hit a roadblock, they can, they'll give you 15 minutes of free time. You can describe your roadblock and they'll try to give you some advice for getting around it. So this is fun. I always come. I'm not even a genealogist and I enjoy it. So I encourage you, if you are interested in genealogy, consider a visit to Raleigh next October. Um, Another thing that's happening uh, with our collections downstairs is we have vast digital collections and we're doing a, um, a redesign of the web pages to get to those collections. Uh, the new interface is in beta right now so if you go to our digital collections you won't see this. <clears throat> but we think that when this comes live and it's going to be later this summer um, it's going to make browsing and searching those collections a lot easier. One of the cool things about the collections is that they are really a joint collection between the State Library and the State Archives. So they contain both primary and secondary materials. And new content is flagged, as you can see on the left here in this slide, um, the new content, uh, which is 1901 Confederate pension applications, <clears throat> are um, flagged as something new that's available to the public. And I imagine that would be useful content for genealogists looking up those pension applications. And Jeffrey has put the URL up. So if you're into genealogy, you're in luck. We've got a lot going on. Moving on, I'm moving up now to library development, which is um, 
the section of the State Library that sponsors uh, the NC Cardinal Project. And you can see some of our latest data there. Um, this project is growing, which is really good news because we also share materials among all the counties that are in red. Um, we have had, we did a survey this just recently and heard um, some comments about maybe slow down a little bit and spend a little more time getting things um, working better and we're hearing you and we're heeding you and we are making plans to um... oh thanks Jan uh, we're making plans to uh, follow up with on some of your recommendations um, some of the things that <clears throat> have taken place lately is an implementation of cataloging standards. Everybody's sharing one catalog that gets more important when it, as the bigger the catalog gets. We're implementing cost sharing for the very first time this year. So um, some libraries, the early adopters are starting to bear some of their own costs because we want this to be sustainable over the long term. And we're expanding training. We've also had um, some staff changes. David Green is leaving us. He's been our support person, and we're hiring another person now. <laughs> so expect that to be coming. I'm going to move on now to continuing education. We got a lot going on in this area, not the least of which is because of the changes at NC Live. With the change of the base platform in NC Live, this is going to require a lot of changes to our training modules that the State Library offers on NC Live. And all of those workshops will be revised. And that includes NC Live Basics, the Health, Business, NC Live Advanced, and NC Live Kids. So we're going to start with the Basics workshop, obviously, and work on all of those uh, in the coming months. We're also looking at offering some new formats for learning. <coughs> We've offered face-to-face -face classes, but now we're looking at on-demand and blended self-paced learning. The on-demand classes will be ones where libraries can say, we really see a need for training in customer service, say, in our area. And we hope that uh, the person who expresses that need would be willing to host the workshop and then willing to go out and beat the bushes and get um, people from neighboring libraries to attend the workshop. We want to make sure that we are making the best use of our dollars. And the way to do that with continuing education is to ensure that we have full classrooms whenever we train. We're adding a new State Library sponsored page to Train Station. That will make it easier for you to find those workshops that are being sponsored by the State Library. because. The train station includes training from multiple um, providers. We're gonna, we would like to offer some new workshops on soft skills, things like adapting to change or conflict resolution or teamwork. Those will be coming up in the spring. Uh, we do administer an annual survey. So if you have specific wants or desires about our workshops, that's your chance. And I hope you'll take the opportunity to let us know what it is you want and need. We're also working on updating our technology competencies. These are listed on the web. You can see the URL there. They're out of date at this point. Um, and the reason we're doing this is because it could be useful for updating and determining what your training needs are, either for an organization or for an individual. So if you want to um, check and see where you are with your technology competencies, you can use that as a resource. That, with, that's in the process right now. They're not ready to go, but you can go look at them if you like. For the EDGE project, this was a very interesting project. And North Carolina was extremely fortunate to be on the cutting edge, pun intended of this project. We were a pilot state. And we're supposed to only have four libraries uh, complete this assessment. And what this is, it's a project um, sponsored by multiple uh, different entities. And the goal is to support libraries in making strategic decisions and identifying areas where they need to improve 
around library technology and digital literacy. The Gates Foundation were one of the big funders, but other organizations such as the Urban Library Council and Lyricists were also involved. So uh, we, our four libraries took part, but then we managed to uh, get selected as one of, I think it was about six libraries, or six states that were able to deploy the initiative uh, statewide. This is going to be a paid product. I mean, the rest of the lot of states are going to have to pay if they want to initiate EDGE in their libraries. We were a, sort of a test case. And I will tell you that based on the feedback we've gotten so far, um, I think it was well worth it. I would be, I'll be interested to see what the libraries say. Um, you can see the results at the URL at the bottom of the screen there. But I want to share some of our early results with you. And I'm getting ready to, I'm keeping it short, but I am going to be throwing some statistics at you right here. Um, so this, uh, you can see that there were three strategic areas, community value, engaging the community, and organizational management. And these benchmarks were all arranged according to these three categories. So for um, North Carolina, the three benchmarks and within each of those areas, there are benchmarks. So there were three within community value, uh, three in engaging the community, and four, I think, in organizational management. So the benchmarks where we received the lowest statewide scores were in engaging the community. It was strategy and evaluation. And then down under organizational management, it was devices and bandwidth and technology inclusiveness. So that this is sort of underscoring some assumptions that we've had about bandwidth in this state, but now we have the hard data to back up those assumptions. The three benchmarks for which we received the highest scores were digital tools and resources, and I love this one, staff expertise, well, I could have told them that, and technology management. Also, an interesting outcome of this is that libraries tested their bandwidth, the, so the actual speed, and 26% of North Carolina branch libraries did not even meet the minimum requirements for bandwidth level one, meaning library pan patrons can't count on the bandwidth provided to consistently complete basic online tasks, such as applying for jobs. On the other hand, 56% of branches were level three, meaning they could provide the highest level of bandwidth recognized by EDGE. So we have, a, we have a, a wide range there of bandwidth. One thing that we all agree on, though, is when broadband speed was compared for internet service providers' advertised speed versus the actual upload and download speeds at the library, speeds were consistently advertised as significantly faster than what the service actually provided. So you're buying what you think is uh, level three access, but what you're getting in some cases is actually level two or even level one access. So um, we have just gotten these results and are just beginning to really dive into them. Um, Joyce Chapman is our consultant for data analysis, and she's creating some resources. The public library directors are having a fall meeting, and we're going to be discussing this at length at that meeting. And I think it's going to be very interesting, not only for pointing the way for where libraries need to go, but also for providing us with some data that we can use both on the state and the national level for those advocacy efforts to prove what it is what we re we're really doing. At the same time that libraries were tasked with filling out the EDGE benchmark, they, oh, also on EDGE, just one more thing, there's a lot of, there are a lot of resources available to EDGE libraries. So if you find that after completing the um, analysis that you're scoring low in a certain area, there, EDGE provides a website where you can go and get resources for improving your, your scores in certain areas. So. It's, it's really a, a nice little package and very helpful to libraries. But as far as impact, um, at the same time that libraries were completing the EDGE assessment, we were asking them to also deploy these, this impact survey. And you can see the URL there. 
Um, the impact survey was uh, a survey for library patrons who are using your computers. And libraries deployed it on their computer screens. So when a patron sat down to use a public access computer, they were offered the chance to fill out the impact survey. 5,000 plus patrons uh, did fill out that survey in 38 libraries. And the report is available of what, you know, what those patrons said at the, uh, the URL. So some of the findings of this survey are also really interesting and I think can be impactful both on the local level and on the state level. So for instance, 26% of respondents, that's a quarter of the people using those computers, used them to search online for jobs. 344 people, or 6% of all respondents, successfully got a job after using the library's computers to search and apply for it. So imagine being able to go to your local officials and say, you know, in my county, X number of people actually got jobs after using the library computers. I think that would be very compelling and um, a, a wonderful argument for continued or even expanded funding for our libraries. Again, the data off of this survey are just brand spanking new and we're just sort of digging into them. And we would hope that, um, again, this is a, a product that we can purchase for the state. And we would like to discuss this with the directors and see if they think it's worth it um, to uh, redeploy it next year, perhaps, and uh, maybe get even greater uh, buy-in on filling out the survey. So we could, if we could hit 50% of the libraries, that would be great. Or higher, it would be even better. Uh, sticking with the data theme, the annual public library survey was released on, to public libraries on July 15th, and it's due September 15th. This is how we collect data about libraries in North Carolina. And again, we use the data on the national level. Um, and it's, it's reported to the national level, so IMLS and ALA and other organizations like that use this data. They crunch the numbers and release reports. Um, various universities and researchers around the country use the data to compile reports and analyze data sets to predict what's happening to libraries. And of course, at the statewide level, it's very useful too. I've just included some trends here uh, for the last five years and um, four, four years, I guess. And you can see that um, I think it's really interesting that while the, our collections and circulation are declining, and that was, if, this, if you think that this data goes back to 2009, that's where, when things really started going south with the budget. Um, operation income is rising, so it's coming back up from the 2009 years of declining. Um, while reference and library visits are declining, annual hours are rising. That is because annual hours were cut when budgets were cut. And I think that that ties directly to the decrease in the number of library visits and the number of reference uh, transactions. And then programs and attendance are rising. So Joyce Chapman does a wonderful job. And once we get your data, not only do we turn it over to um, the feds, and so all states are reporting the same data elements, and we get a really good picture of the national library scene. Um, we also will crunch the numbers and report it back out to libraries, and we can see where the trends are going for 2014. So thanks for all the work that libraries do filling this out. It is uh, valuable data for us and others. Um, so now let's talk about the Center for the Book. Uh, the contact for the Center for the Book is Molly Westmoreland, and she reports that North Carolina will be represented at the National Book Festival in Washington, D.C. on August 30th. All the states show up at this festival, and they highlight a book set or having to do with their state in some way. And our, our book this year is The Ghosts of Tupelo Landing by Sheila Turnage. <clears throat> so it could be that Sheila's a North Carolina author. I think she is. 
Um, so if you're in Washington around August 30th, you might want to check in. It's a lot of fun and uh, a lot of people attend. We're also continuing our Let's Talk About It program, which is scholar-led reading and discussion um, in libraries. And we collaborate with the NC Humanities Council on that. If you want to know more, contact Molly Westmoreland here at the State Library. That's a popular and ongoing program. And another popular program that we offer is summer reading. Laurie Special, our youth services consultant, has provided the themes for years upcoming. So next summer it will be Heroes, and then in 2016 it will be Sports, Wellness, and Fitness. <clears throat> the summer reading uh, programs in local libraries are winding up now, and I want to say a big thank you to those libraries that use the Counting Opinions Reading Club software to count how many minutes their patrons read and to register summer reading participants. 39 libraries are working with this application. And it really was in beta format, probably more than we actually realized when we agreed to deploy it this year. Um, it wasn't even listed on the Counting Opinions website when we were in the process of making a purchase for the software. Um, once the application has its ba basic configuration done for summer reading, then libraries, and we will do that at the state level, then libraries can choose what aspects of the software program they want to use. We are, of course, going to get lots of feedback from the 39 libraries. We're planning to really do a deep dive and to see what their experience was like. I know some libraries were unable to use it, but we think it's a pretty good program and that we're, we can provide some good feedback to counting opinions for improvements for next year. Just as an FYI, this program can be used for any, any reading program, adult reading programs, uh, winter reading programs. So it's not um, limited just to summer reading. <clears throat> we will keep um, information coming about this on the listservs as we work with counting opinions and uh, provide upgrades to the, to the uh, software as it stands. I also just want to make you aware that four of the libraries in the state also participated, bless their hearts, in a pilot program by AWE. And AWE is the vendor that provides the children's computers. And their summer reading program contained, the, it was very much like counting opinions. You know, you count it online and children could interact online. Children can take part in your summer reading program without ever having to set foot in the library. And we were thinking of this as a really good resource that we could offer out to the camps for the third grade uh, reading uh, program, kids that are having to attend those summer reading camps. So it would be a useful tool to offer to the schools that are uh, providing those camps. But the AWE program, the big difference there is that it offers parents an opportunity for their children to take a um, some sort of reading uh, level indicator uh, assessment at the beginning of the summer and then again at the end of the summer so parents can see if their children have gained uh, in, in reading skills or maintained uh, at least and not ha haven't you know slided back. So. Um, we're going to, again, also evaluate that program very carefully as well and see if that is a useful tool that libraries might like to deploy um, <clears throat> themselves. We're coming to the end here, folks. So just a couple more slides and we'll be done. Um, I want to make you aware of CREST. This is a really uh, cool service that comes from the Department of Cultural Resources. And CREST stands for Cultural Resources Emergency Support Team. Um, I'm mentioning this because the picture there at the bottom is uh, showing um, CREST work at, in Burnsville at a library from the Amy Regional Library System that suffered, uh, they, they call it a polar vortex, but it was a burst water pipe or some sort of water damage. And they called Crest. And I don't know if you know where Burnsville is, but it's, but it's out there a ways. And within two hours, uh, people were on site to actually guide and help with the um, 
reclamation of um, very wet books. So it, a survey has shown that more and more institutions have written disaster plans, but they don't revisit them, keep them up to date, or really do adequate staff training. So uh, North Carolina was ranked fourth in the nation for the amount of damage sustained due to natural disasters. So we, we are suffering more than our share of hurricanes, burst pipes, fire. So <clears throat> the Cultural Resources Emergency Support Team stands ready to help. They can offer workshops if you're interested in having them come and help you or you and your neighbors uh, develop a disaster plan or to mitigate after a disaster happens. <clears throat> the pictures shown here are all in North Carolina. The top one is a Lost Colony costume shop fire. And the one in the middle is the Thomas Wolf House. And that was actually arson, very tragically. And then the bottom one is the Bur uh, Burnsville Library. So just keep it in mind. You don't have to remember the name, and you don't have to remember anything other than if you have a disaster, call us here at the State Library. We will put you in touch with the Crest team, and I think you'll be glad you did. Uh, the director at Amy Reach and Dan Barron is a huge fan now and uh, just sings their praises. So that's sort of what's going on now. What are we looking at in the future or on the radar? Well, again, if you've read the newspaper, you probably read that President Obama signed the Workforce Investment Act, Act uh, on Tuesday of this week. This is a rewritten act, and um, it has now been you know, put into place, and it's actually going to be something that, we, that may have an impact on public libraries. Uh, ALA Washington office worked very hard on getting libraries included in this act. And they are in that it, the act expands the uh, definition of workforce development programs. And libraries can now be uh, designated as uh, workforce development programs. The act provides funding from the federal government to states to help them carry out workforce investment um, activities. So obviously, we here at the State Library are monitoring this very closely. We're staying in touch with the staff at the Washington office. And we are uh, re, uh, recontacting or reestablishing our contacts that we've had at the Department of Commerce and in other areas of state government so that we can keep our finger on the pulse of this. If there's any, you know, if it looks like there's any way that libraries can get their hands on some of this funding or take advantage of some of the new changes to this act, we want to be on top of it and be ready to jump. So we're going to be monitoring this very closely over the coming months. It's just, right at this point, it's just way too soon to tell. You know, it was signed on Tuesday. So it'll be, it may be a year before we know anything. But we're, we're staying on top of it for you. Um, so stay tuned on that. Data, data, data. Well, you can tell that data is a big thing, um, both here in the state and nationally, with all of these data efforts, EDGE, the impact study, and others. So I expect to hear more about this. As I said, it's going to be a big topic of conversation with the public library directors uh, at their fall meeting. And uh, we, we will be making some decisions about how we want to move forward with some of the um, offers and the products that will help us both capture and uh, use data. So you'll be hearing more about, about that going forward. Um, another thing is we're carrying out right now an NC Knows analysis. NC Knows is our online virtual reference service. It has been funded by LSTA funds for 10 years now. And uh, we're looking at all long-term projects that have been funded with LSTA because the purpose of those funds are really not operational. It's um, to bring up new programs, see if they fly, and then, um, you know, if they do, send them on their way to be self-supporting or in, you know, find some other way for them to continue to operate. 
I'm not saying that we would do away with NC nodes, but what we want to do is look at it and see if uh, what is the best way, well, actually, what is the need for this kind of service, this 24-hour chat reference service? And <clears throat> once we know the level of need, then we're asking our consultant to take a really broad view of what's the best way to meet that need. So we're surveying other states. We're surveying users of NC Knows. We're surveying all the providers, the librarians who uh, keep the service up and running. And we're going to be trying to uh, get, a, get a handle on that, uh, that whole issue and how do we want to move forward. If it's really worth it to the state, we're going to, of course, keep uh, rendering that service in some way, shape, or form. So that will be ongoing. If you get asked to fill out a survey, and there it is, so I'm asking you, please do fill it out because we want to make sure we get the uh, a correct read from the state and the people, the librarians and the users for this service to uh, really see what, what the impact and the interest is in that service. So that is all of my slides and we got through in record time. So what I want to know is what questions do you have for me? And I mean really, anything y'all want to ask, let's get it out on the table and I'll tell you what I know. So hmm. captioning. Can you tell me more, Emily? I'm not sure what you're talking about. This is, I will say this is a big organization, folks, and I do not know everything that we're involved in. Is this closed captioning from the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, maybe? Well, one of the things you may not know, I'm just going to take a stab on the captioning, is that um, the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, aside from providing books and cassettes, and even now they're moving into the digital arena to serve the needs of people with visual handicaps or even physical handicaps who can't open a book, hold a book, um, they also offer a DVD service with closed caption on the DVD. So. Uh, someone who is hearing impaired can watch a DVD and keep up with the action and the dialogue via the closed captioning. That is a wonderful service and we'd love for you to help us get the word out of all the, um, all the wonderful things that the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped can provide. And it's all free of charge, folks. So if you've got a, a longtime patron who's been a heavy user of your collection and they're getting to the point where they are having a hard time seeing, please turn them on to LBPH. Yeah, I think that, I think that is the closed captioning service. Um, it's something we offer, Emily. I don't know if there are changes to it. Um, I can put you in touch with staff out there at LBPH and they could tell you. Yes, you're right, John. And I think we're going to be uh, we're talking with NC Live about uh, updating some of the lib guides, uh, especially around the NC Live resources, um, because so many libraries are using them. So um, we're looking at doing some, uh, you know, making some standard templated NC guide, uh, NC Live lib guides that people can use. Okay. Ah, Emily, I'm going to have to refer you to, thanks, Jane. I'm going to have to refer you to LBPH on that. So if you can email me, and my address is right there, uh, let's talk about this a little bit, and I can get you some expert help, because I am in no way an expert on that. So any other questions? I'm thrilled to even have these. The comment from John and the questions. The questions from Anthony.
Welcome back, Jean. We're glad to have you back at Madison County.